The Open Secret Delivered at Los Angeles, Calif, 5th January 1900 Whichever way we turn in trying to understand things in their reality, if we analyze far enough, we find that at last we come to a peculiar state of things, seemingly a contradiction, something which our reason cannot grasp and yet is a fact. We take up something, we know it is finite, but as soon as we begin to analyze it, it leads us beyond our reason and we never find an end to all its qualities, its possibilities, its powers, its relations. It has become infinite. Take even a common flower that is finite enough, but who is there that can say he knows all about the flower? There is no possibility of anyone's getting to the end of the knowledge about that one flower. The flower has become infinite, the flower which was finite to begin with. Take a grain of sand. Analyze it. We start with the assumption that it is finite, and at last we find that it is not, it is infinite, all the same, we have looked upon it as finite. The flower is similarly treated as a finite something. So with all our thoughts and experiences, physical and mental, we begin, we may think, on a small scale, and grasp them as little things, but very soon they elude our knowledge and plunge into the abyss of the infinite. And the greatest and the first thing perceived is ourselves. We are also in the same dilemma about existence. We exist. We see we are finite beings. We live and die. Our horizon is narrow. We are here, limited, confronted by the universe all around. Nature can crush us out of existence in a moment. Our little bodies are just held together, ready to go to pieces at a moment's notice. We know that. In the region of action how powerless we are. Our will is being thwarted at every turn. So many things we want to do, and how few we can do. There is no limit to our willing. We can will everything, want everything. We can desire to go to the dog star. But how few of our desires can be accomplished? The body will not allow it. Well, nature is against the accomplishment of our will. We are weak. What is true of the flower, of the grain of sand, of the physical world, and of every thought, is a hundredfold more true of ourselves. We are also in the same dilemma of existence, being finite and infinite at the same time. We are like waves in the ocean, the wave is the ocean and yet not the ocean. There is not any part of the wave of which you cannot say, it is the ocean. The name ocean applies to the wave and equally to every other part of the ocean and yet it is separate from the ocean. So in this infinite ocean of existence, we are like wavelets. At the same time, when we want really to grasp ourselves, we cannot, we have become the infinite. We seem to be walking in dreams. Dreams are all right in a dream mind, but as soon as you want to grasp one of them, it is gone. Why? Not that it was false, but because it is beyond the power of reason, the power of the intellect to comprehend it. Everything in this life is so vast that the intellect is nothing in comparison with it. It refuses to be bound by the laws of the intellect. It laughs at the bondage the intellect wants to spread around it. And a thousandfold more so is this the case with the human soul. We ourselves, this is the greatest mystery of the universe. How wonderful it all is! Look at the human eye. How easily it can be destroyed, and yet the biggest suns exist only because your eyes see them. The world exists because your eyes certify that it exists. Think of that mystery. These poor little eyes. A strong light or a pin can destroy them. Yet the most powerful engines of destruction, the most powerful cataclysms, the most wonderful of existences, 
millions of suns and stars and moons and earth all depend for their existence upon and have to be certified by these two little things. They say, nature, you exist and we believe nature exists. So with all our senses, what is this? Where is weakness? Who is strong? What is great and what is small? What is high and what is low in this marvelous interdependence of existence where the smallest atom is necessary for the existence of the whole? Who is great and who is small? It is past finding out. And why? Because none is great and none is small. All things are interpenetrated by that infinite ocean. Their reality is that infinite and whatever there is on the surface is but that infinite. The tree is infinite, so is everything that you see or feel, every grain of sand, every thought, every soul, everything that exists is infinite. Infinite is finite and finite infinite. This is our existence. Now, that may be all true, but all this feeling after the infinite is at present mostly unconscious. It is not that we have forgotten that infinite nature of ours, none can ever do that. Who can ever think that he can be annihilated? Who can think that he will die? None can. All our relation to the infinite works in us unconsciously. In a manner, therefore, we forget our real being and hence all this misery comes. In practical daily life we are hurt by small things, we are enslaved by little beings. Misery comes because we think we are finite, we are little beings. And yet, how difficult it is to believe that we are infinite beings. In the midst of all this misery and trouble, when a little thing may throw me off my balance, it must be my care to believe that I am infinite. And the fact is that we are, and that consciously or unconsciously we are all searching after that something which is infinite, we are always seeking for something that is free. There was never a human race which did not have a religion and worship some sort of God or Gods. Whether the God or Gods existed or not is no question, but what is the analysis of this psychological phenomenon? Why is all the world trying to find or seeking for a God? Why? Because in spite of all this bondage, in spite of nature and this tremendous energy of law grinding us down, never allowing us to turn to any side wherever we go, whatever we want to do, we are thwarted by this law, which is everywhere, in spite of all this, the human soul never forgets its freedom and is ever seeking it. The search for freedom is the search of all religions, whether they know it or not, whether they can formulate it well or ill, the idea is there. Even the lowest man, the most ignorant, seeks for something which has power over nature's laws. He wants to see a demon, a ghost, a god, somebody who can subdue nature, for whom nature is not almighty, for whom there is no law. Oh, for somebody who can break the law. That is the cry coming from the human heart. We are always seeking for someone who breaks the law. The rushing engine speeds along the railway track, the little worm crawls out of its way. We at once say, the engine is dead matter, a machine, and the worm is alive, because the worm attempted to break the law. The engine, with all its power and might, can never break the law. It is made to go in any direction man wants, and it cannot do otherwise, but the worm, small and little though it was, attempted to break the law and avoid the danger. It tried to assert itself against law, assert its freedom, and there was the sign of the future God in it. Everywhere we see this assertion of freedom, this freedom of the soul. It is reflected in every religion in the shape of God or Gods, but it is all external yet for those who only see the Gods outside. Man decided that he was nothing. He was afraid that he could never be free. 
So he went to seek for someone outside of nature who was free. Then he thought that there were many and many such free beings, and gradually he merged them all into one God of Gods and Lord of Lords. Even that did not satisfy him. He came a little closer to truth, a little nearer, and then gradually found that whatever he was, he was in some way connected with the God of Gods and Lord of Lords, that he, though he thought himself bound and low and weak, was somehow connected with that God of Gods. Then visions came to him, thought arose and knowledge advanced, and he began to come nearer and nearer to that God, and at last found out that God and all the Gods, this whole psychological phenomenon connected with the search for an all-powerful free soul, was but a reflection of his own idea of himself. And then at last he discovered that it was not only true that God made man after his own image, but that it was also true that man made God after his own image. That brought out the idea of divine freedom. The divine being was always within, the nearest of the near. Him we had ever been seeking outside, and at last found that he is in the heart of our hearts. You may know the story of the man who mistook his own heartbeat for somebody knocking at the door and went to the door and opened it but found nobody there, so he went back. Again he seemed to hear a knocking at the door, but nobody was there. Then he understood that it was his own heartbeat and he had misinterpreted it as a knocking at the door. Similarly, man after his search finds out that this infinite freedom that he was placing in imagination all the time in the nature outside is the internal subject, the eternal soul of souls, this reality, he himself. Thus at last he comes to recognize this marvelous duality of existence, the subject infinite and finite in one, the infinite being is also the same finite soul. The infinite is caught, as it were, in the meshes of the intellect and apparently manifests as finite beings, but the reality remains unchanged. This is, therefore, true knowledge that the soul of our souls, the reality that is within us, is that which is unchangeable, eternal, ever blessed, ever free. This is the only solid ground for us to stand upon. This, then, is the end of all death, the advent of all immortality, the end of all misery. And he who sees that one among the many, that one unchangeable in the universe of change, he who sees him as the soul of his soul, unto him belongs eternal peace unto none else. And in the midst of the depths of misery and degradation, the soul sends a ray of light, and man wakes up and finds that what is really his, he can never lose. No, we can never lose what is really ours. Who can lose his being? Who can lose his very existence? If I am good, it is the existence first, and then that becomes colored with the quality of goodness. If I am evil, it is the existence first, and that becomes colored with the quality of badness. That existence is first, last, and always, it is never lost, but ever present. Therefore, there is hope for all. None can die, none can be degraded forever. Life is but a playground, however gross the play may be. However we may receive blows, and however knocked about we may be, the soul is there and is never injured. We are that infinite. Thus sang a Vedantin, I never had fear nor doubt. Death never came to me. I never had father or mother, for I was never born. Where are my foes? For I am all. I am the existence and knowledge and bliss absolute. I am it. I am it. Anger and lust and jealousy, evil thoughts and all these things, never came to me, for I am the existence, the knowledge, the bliss absolute. I am it. I am it. That is the remedy for all disease, the nectar that cures death. Here we are in this world, and our nature rebels against it. 
But let us repeat, I am it, I am it. I have no fear, nor doubt, nor death. I have no sex, nor creed, nor color. What creed can I have? What sect is there to which I should belong? What sect can hold me? I am in every sect, however much the body rebels, however much the mind rebels, in the midst of the uttermost darkness, in the midst of agonizing tortures, in the uttermost despair, repeat this, once, twice, thrice, evermore. Light comes gently, slowly, but surely it comes. Many times I have been in the jaws of death, starving, footsore, and weary, for days and days I had had no food, and often could walk no farther, I would sink down under a tree, and life would seem ebbing away. I could not speak, I could scarcely think, but at last the mind reverted to the idea, I have no fear nor death, I never hunger nor thirst. I am it, I am it, the whole of nature cannot crush me, it is my servant. Assert thy strength, thou Lord of lords and God of gods. Regain thy lost empire. Arise and walk and stop not. And I would rise up, reinvigorated, and here am I, living, today. Thus, whenever darkness comes, assert the reality and everything adverse must vanish. For, after all, it is but a dream. Mountain high though the difficulties appear, terrible and gloomy though all things seem, they are but maya. Fear not, it is banished. Crush it, and it vanishes. Stamp upon it, and it dies. Be not afraid. Think not how many times you fail. Never mind. Time is infinite. Go forward, assert yourself again and again, and light must come. You may pray to everyone that was ever born, but who will come to help you? And what of the way of death from which none knows escape? Help thyself out by thyself. None else can help thee, friend. For thou alone art thy greatest enemy, thou alone art thy greatest friend. Get hold of the self, then. Stand up. Don't be afraid. In the midst of all miseries and all weakness, let the self come out, faint and imperceptible though it be at first. You will gain courage, and at last like a lion you will roar out, I am it, I am it, I am neither a man, nor a woman, nor a god, nor a demon, no, nor any of the animals, plants, or trees. I am neither poor nor rich, neither learned nor ignorant. All these things are very little compared with what I am, for I am it, I am it, behold the sun and the moon and the stars, I am the light that is shining in them. I am the beauty of the fire. I am the power in the universe. For I am it, I am it, whoever thinks that I am little makes a mistake, for the self is all that exists. The sun exists because I declare it does, the world exists because I declare it does. Without me they cannot remain, for I am existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute, ever happy, ever pure, ever beautiful. Behold, the sun is the cause of our vision, but is not itself ever affected by any defect in the eyes of any one, even so I am. I am working through all organs, working through everything, but never does the good and evil of work attach to me. For me there is no law, nor karma. I own the laws of karma. I ever was and ever am. My real pleasure was never in earthly things, in husband, wife, children, and other things. For I am like the infinite blue sky. Clouds of many colors pass over it and play for a second, they move off. And there is the same unchangeable blue. Happiness and misery, good and evil, may envelop me for a moment, wailing the self, but I am still there. They pass away because they are changeable. I shine because I am unchangeable. If misery comes, I know it is finite, therefore it must die. 
If evil comes, I know it is finite, it must go. I alone am infinite and untouched by anything. For I am the infinite, that eternal, changeless self. So sings one of our poets, Let us drink of this cup, this cup that leads to everything that is immortal, everything that is unchangeable. Fear not. Believe not that we are evil, that we are finite. That we can ever die. It is not true. This is to be heard of, then to be thought upon, and then to be meditated upon. When the hands work, the mind should repeat, I am it. I am it. Think of it, dream of it, until it becomes bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh, until all the hideous dreams of littleness, of weakness, of misery, and of evil have entirely vanished, and no more then can the truth be hidden from you even for a moment.